You gotta know what a crumpet is to understand cricket. Hello and welcome everybody back to another episode of the Cult Cinema Podcast. I'm Gage. I'm Ashley. And I guess we're going to have to start calling the uh, the 90s classic podcast because we're still <laughs> stuck in the 90s for this episode. We are. Talking yeah. about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the original film from 1990. Yeah. So this was your pick for our, you know, kids classic movies that we wanted to do. So yeah. what, ma- what made you want to go with this one as opposed to... Any other um, one? I don't know. I had recently seen a funny article because Megan Fox and Machine Gun Kelly are, you know, a couple. They're getting married or whatever, yeah. and she was in the reboot. And I read this article she did with I don't know GQ or something about how much fun she had doing the movie. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go back and watch the original because I don't remember much of like what it was about or yeah. <laughs> all that stuff and. Well, watching this as an adult was definitely rough times. <laughs> really? <laughs> Little bit. I, I had a blast rewatching this. Oh, good. Um, good. So I'm interested to, to get your take on why you thought it was, uh, you know. I, I Did you think it was, like, bad, or was did you just think it was weird going back to it, or... Um, yeah, a little weird going back to it, but also yeah. not great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, there's, there's definitely so many, some things like, that holes. Hold up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love this movie and I, you know, even though they are just goofy as hell and there's definitely some issues with them, I, um, I wouldn't say that the sequels are as great, but are probably as memorable as this one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this was kind of my first introduction to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as a kid, as opposed mm-hmm. to the TMNT show that was on CW4 Kids around the early to mid 2000s. Um, but I, I love these movies, and it's oh, I, I think I last time I watched it was a couple years ago when they first came on Netflix, um, and I rewatched yeah. them. Yeah. I don't remember. I watched the cartoon, um, and I don't remember. I should have looked that up too. What that broadcast on, and you know who put that out initially. But I remember the cartoon being fun for yeah. sure. All right. Well, if we want to go through a little bit of plot synopsis before we start breaking everything down. Sure. So, um, yeah, from the 90s, obviously, and this is very 90s, everything about it's 90s. Yeah. (laughs) Including the camera work and the quality of the film itself. Um, Mm. There are, how many of them are there? Five? Ninja Turtle movies? No, Ninja Turtles. Oh, there's four. 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 (laughs) Four turtles get turned into crime-fighting ninjas, because that's... (laughs) the most believable sentence that's ever come out of my <laughs> mouth <laughs> but also they have a giant rat that is their sensei named splinter mm-hmm. um and basically these guys start to fight crime a little bit um there's a huge crime wave in new york at the time and that was definitely on par with the real world 90s mm-hmm. in new york man talk about some crazy living if you're in the 90s yeah. in new york from my understanding from the 70s to the 90s it was kind of a total shit show i mean it's always a total shit show in new york from the sounds of it um, yeah yeah i but, have some friends that live there and i'm like how yeah. how do you function in this city <laughs> there's but, some spots that are really n- i've only been in new york once there's some spots that are really nice the rest of it is just like it's just trash everywhere and it smells yeah and it just yeah, yeah. trashy trash trash everywhere um, but these guys fight crime. Um, they get a sidekick, a human sidekick named April, the mm-hmm. only woman in the movie, but cool. Um, yeah. She's they, like a news reporter. So. Yeah, she's a news reporter um, who constantly gets shit on in this movie. And I'm like, why? I don't understand. But from her boss and uh, not from the turtles themselves, but just every yeah. other man in this movie like shits on her. It's like, really discouraging. Yeah. And Casey Jones just being a a total tool. Casey fucking Jones, yeah, (laughs) being a tool. But the actor, Elias, uh, I forget his last name, I did write it down. Uh, Um, Coteas? Yeah, big fan. K-O-T-E-A-S. 
big fan of that guy. He's been in a bunch of really cool stuff. So this might have been his first film, too. I'm going to guess it probably was. Maybe. I don't. I can't think of any other films off the top of my head that he's been in, but. Uh, a few horror, some okay. horror stuff and like true crime type stuff. Gotcha. He was on a, the show Blue Bloods for a while as a okay. cop. So, I mean, gotcha. he's been around. Um, but anyway, they are, they basically go up against the, sh- what is it, Shredder? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and his, like, band of ninjas, which the costumes on the ninjas are really fun. The because they clans. have Yeah. There's no mouth holes, mm-hmm. so obviously they don't talk. It's just, like, these mesh talk. eyes. Yeah. And they're just in full ninja gear, but they're mm-hmm. people. They're not, obviously, like, other animals or whatever. Yeah. Um, they eventually, like, that's their nemesis, kind of, and they, they, I thought it was weird. I don't remember this a whole lot, but... They were, like, recruiting teenagers to do their bidding part yeah. of the time. <laughs> That's the whole thing is that the Foot Clan, at least this, like, because it's... The Foot Clan started as, like, a ga- like a ninja gang in Japan. Yeah. And they kind of made their way over, and they just started recruiting a bunch of kids. Because they have this whole, like, layer. And yeah, it's, like, it's, the classic it... 90s grunge layer. is similar to the one that we saw in uh, in Hackers. Exactly. Where there's, like, roller... Bl- blading and skateboard ramps everywhere arcade cabinets uh guys offering 11 year old cigarettes exactly Um. (laughs) like 11 12 year olds are smoking chain smoking cigarettes playing cards and dice like gambling and shit and i'm like i mean this could have happened (laughs) in new york in the 90s i guess there's a a bit where like the guy who asks uh there's a kid he's like you guys got any cigarettes and the guy's like regular or menthol the guy that goes regular or menthol that's sam rockwell yeah and I was like, I know I recognize that guy. Who is that? And I looked it up, and it was him. And I was like, oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah. Um, He's in it, too. But, yeah, but yeah, they they fight the, you know, these gang, this gang, essentially. And they win to an extent. And, oh, they kidnap Splinter. And that's kind of what spurs the whole, like, rivalry on. Because mm-hmm. they got to get him back. And um, they make it seem like they torture Splinter, but we don't see any of that because it is a kids' movie. So yeah, I mean that's good. But there was apparently a lot of stuff that still got dubbed down, like uh, like the violence and was like heavily censored, especially in other countries. There's uh, the German release has like cartoon sound effects added in during the fight scenes and stuff. Oh, that would have so, been better, I think. You think so? I don't. I yeah. think it just makes it even more ridiculous. Because I mean, the yeah. movie's already kind of ridiculous, but it like. I don't know. I wouldn't want the fight scenes to be more goofy. If anything, I just wish they were a little better shot. Um, granted, they're limited due to like the weird costumes that they have to wear, but there's surprisingly a, a great amount of like range of motion that they have in those costumes. Yeah. Yeah. I have a whole bunch of stuff about the costumes. I was like, yeah, so do I. This is probably the most uncomfortable thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> it just was. Full on latex suit and a helmet that's just with a bunch of motors in it. Yep. Yeah. So they defeat Treader and his gang, and April gets her job back because she's fired throughout some of the movie and becomes a reporter again, and happy ending. Oh, and her and Casey hook up at the end. <laughs> that's, a, yeah. that's about it. <laughs> yeah. So what's interesting about, like, the whole plot is that, so Shredder is the main antagonist, and Splinter kind of sets up that... Um, he doesn't know, like, no one knows who Shredder is. Or no, Splinter must know who Shredder is. He knows, because he yeah. tells the whole backstory of, you know, him killing... Of, yeah, Shredder killing his master and... Master, yeah. Yeah. And his wife or whatever. And Yeah. But the whole thing, like, the whole time, the Turtles have no idea who Shredder is. Or, like, know that the whole story is related to the situation they're currently in. Because it's not until Shredder shows up at the end to fight them that they're like, oh, who's this guy? And then, because, mm-hmm. the, like, the whole thing is like you would think that the plot is like oh it's the evil they have to defeat the evil shredder and they do but their whole like motivation is like it's just to uh just to get back splinter like they don't really know who's kidnapped him or what's really going on or anything like that right so in the cartoons the whole shredder versus them is the whole it's the whole thing right like yeah. every episode there's you know, Shredder did a new thing that we got to prevent, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So I think it's interesting that they don't choose to do that in the live actions. 
Yeah. And it's like, I, I love how the, the Foot Clan, or like, they don't really, they're not, the Turtles aren't really addressing the whole crime problem that's happening in New York, because they kind of just stay hidden and underground, and occasionally they'll go to the surface, but like, um, even Leonardo says it after they beat up those uh, guys that were about to harass April. Like, they, like uh, Leonardo goes back to Splinter and is like, we finished our first battle. Like, this is their first time on the surface actually fighting. So right. So this is, like, very early into the t- uh, turtles actually becoming, like, they're, like, becoming vigilantes, es- essentially. Mm-hmm. Or superheroes, but. Yeah, I should mention there is a whole cop dynamic, too, where they're like, you know, these things are rogue and they shouldn't be out here doing this. and mm-hmm. But. That's a small part of the movie. That's about it for the plot. It's not too yeah. in depth. <laughs> but to, I guess um, we can talk a little bit about the suits. So the suits are kind of the you know, if you've seen the ninety, you've seen this movie at all, or you've probably seen at least photos of the um, of what these turtles look like. So they're all like latex suits that they're wearing with, uh, and they're made by uh, Jim Henson's Creature Shop, who's responsible for developing all the Muppets. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they developed the costumes for these and that have a bunch of like circuit boards and servo motors built into the head that a multiple puppeteers, uh, depending on which character, but there's usually, you know, the person that's the actor inside of the suit that's doing all of the motion. And then you've got somebody controlling the head with like one hand moving all of like the eyes and the eyebrows. The other one is designed. The other hand is set to open and close the mouth. And then mm-hmm. they have infrared cameras around the mouth that are programmed so, like, whenever they make, like, an ooh face or something like that, then the turtle face will do that. Um, yeah. So it's really interesting the way they have it set up. And then the splinter is completely... Um, A puppet. Puppet, yeah. yeah. Where there's, you know, two to three people actually puppeting splinter at one time with one person kind of holding him up, another person moving the arms, and then another person moving all the face. Mm-hmm. Um but, I saw yeah. a picture online of the inside of the face mm-hmm. yeah. because one of my um, links took me to um, the one guy. I forget which turtle he plays, but he was really outspoken. He was in a lot of the movies, too, in the mm-hmm. costume. And it, the first scene or two, they actually shot one of the animatronics broke his nose while he was in the suit because it like fell oh, really? back or something. Yeah, because they were really heavy. Yeah. And they're big, you know, for the eyes, they have this whole, like, thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the nose had a piece, and obviously it's in the mouth for the puppeting. So, yeah, yeah really in-depth. And they were close to the face, a lot closer than I thought they were. Well, there was, like, a, a fiberglass cowl that was inside of the helmet that would get placed on with all the motors and everything on the outside of it. But they were, like, mm-hmm. these costumes were made to fit the actors. So, yeah, if you have, like, a pretty snug fiberglass helmet around you and something hits you, then, yeah, it's going to cause some damage. Yeah. So. And I guess that's what happened to him. Yeah. And so he just did the horse, the movie with a broken nose. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of weird uh, continuity things that... Um, I didn't really notice when I first watched it, but going back and like doing some research for the video and watching some clips, um, there's some pretty funny stuff uh, in regards to like, there's one scene where Leo and Raph are having like an argument in April's apartment and you can clearly see one of the production guys just in the back corner, (laughs) like the bottom corner of the frame. (laughs) You can also see a boom mic when they're in the house. Oh, really? They like flee the city and go to her country house or whatever. Mm. Yeah, they like pan over in the kitchen to get to Casey, and there's all of a sudden like it's literally like <laughs> like <laughs> they moved it back. <laughs> um, yeah, there was another one like there's the infamous one where uh, Raph and Leo are making up, and you see Donatello like crack some joke, and he opens his mouth real wide, and you can see the actor's face like the inside face. Of, the, of the mouth. Yeah. Um, there's also uh, what, what was another one? You can see like. As Leonardo is walking out of April's apartment, you see his sword get caught on a painting. You can just see, like, the rubber sword just, like, completely bend and, like, wobble around and stuff. <laughs> um, right. So, yeah, there's definitely a, a few little quirks that you can catch if you pay really close attention. Um, For sure. I think that makes yeah. it kind of fun, though, too. Yeah, 100%. Um, I know that... Apparent- so, the guy who directed this, Steve Barron, he... I guess was actually fired close to the end of the production 
because they were mm-hmm. afraid that he was going to make the film a lot more violent and gritty, which was um, more on par with the original comic that was released in the late, like mid to late eighties. Um, and it was the, the cartoon that followed it up is what kind of brought the goofiness to the Ninja Turtles. That was also the, it was the show that introduced them having different colored headbands or face masks or anything like right. that. Cause in the original comic, they were all red and it was just their weapons that made them different. Yeah. Um, but you can tell that the the producers were very much trying to go for like, oh, we want kids to be able to go to this movie and parents not get super upset. And parents apparently still got upset because of the level of violence that was in this movie. It's like the violence isn't even that bad. Like there's um, I think the most intense scene, which they actually did heavily edit. Um, there's one where after they Foot Clan first loses to the Turtles, um Tatsu, who is, like, Shredder's right-hand man that's training all of the Foot Clan members, he, like, uh, starts assaulting one of the guys, and, like, in the original cut, apparently he was gonna, like, Tatsu was gonna kill the kid, um, Mm. but in post, they added, like, sound effects of him breathing and people going, like, oh, he's gonna be okay, so that it wouldn't get, like, super dark, because, yeah, that would be a bit much for a, a PG movie, which is still crazy that this is still rated PG, Given yeah. that you got like kids giving each other cigarettes, and Raphael literally says "bitchin" at the end of the movie, um, uh-huh. and they say "damn" all the time, but it's like PG movies back in the '80s and '90s, you could get away with a lot more than you could now uh, in terms I, of like language and some visuals. I forget when it even was, but there wasn't even a PG-13 rating for I don't know how many years. So. Yeah. I, I there was in the 90s, but I don't... Yeah, you're right. Because I remember reboots... watching The Goonies, and there was, like, people saying damn and shit all the time, and I was like, "Are you, this is rated PG? It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's just how it was, because PG-13 wasn't a thing. I can't remember if the reboot was PG or not, but it doesn't matter. Um, I think the reboot of Ninja Turtles, that's PG-13, I believe. Yeah, that's kind of yeah. what I thought, too. Yeah, I don't think you could get away with making that PG at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> Even in Definitely the 90s. Um, so, apparently, a couple other things here. Um, who The woman who plays April O'Neil, Judith, Ho- Judith Hogue. Um, mm-hmm. So, in the original cartoon, April is known for having this yellow jumpsuit that she always wears. And apparently they had developed one, but... Hogue was like, yeah, I'm not wearing that. That thing is hideous. And so rather than having her constantly wearing like the yellow jumpsuit, they made it more of an homage where in her like introductory scene, we see her wearing like a a long yellow raincoat. Um, So we got a little bit of the original style, but I think that's, I think that's better, honestly, because I think it could get kind of weird if she's just, oh, has like the, a bright yellow jumpsuit on during the entire movie. Um, well, and she has a yellow shirt on through a lot of it. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. But she um, does have, like, pants on, like, regular pants. Mm-hmm. But Judith Hogue is not a actress that's known to be easy to work with anyway, so. Yeah, that explains why her IMDb is pretty much this movie and then just Halloween Town. <laughs> Halloween Town, yeah, Halloween Town, she's... Halloween Town. Yeah, not great. <laughs> So it says online, obviously. Yeah. I don't fucking know you. <laughs> yeah, th- but this yeah, and Halloween that's... Town are the only things I know her from. Apparently she was also in Armageddon. Um, and a few, huh. um, She was in a bunch of other stuff in the 90s, it looks like, in the early 2000s. But none yeah. that I've heard of before. But when it came, So when it came to the Turtles, um, so there's there were basically typically three people like controlling the turtle or like that made up each individual turtle there's the person that's in the costume doing all of the motion the person puppeting the head and then there was also a separate person that would do the voiceover um for the character as well now josh pius who was who did the like who was in the suit for raf also was the voice actor mm-hmm. um, that's the guy Raph. that got the broken nose okay gotcha um but yeah and then there's but they also had the guys that were in the suit themselves also had on-screen cameos. Um, mm-hmm. So Josh Pius, he is the uh, passenger in the taxi that Raphael like flips over in the beginning, and he goes like, "What's that?" And the cab driver goes, "Looks like a turtle in a trench coat." 
uh, <laughs> which I thought was funny. There's some good quotes in here that I've got a couple that I'll write down that I wrote down that I'll get to here in a second. Yeah, some um, of the jokes are it's cheese bally, but they're yeah. funny. <laughs> um, Leaf Tilden, who was uh, in the suit for Donnie, he plays the foot soldier that confronts April in the subway. Like when they all like he's like the messenger. Um, so we don't get to see his face, but it's cool that he had like an additional role in the movie. Um, and then McKellen Sisti, who plays Mikey, is the pizza delivery guy um, at the beginning, which is interesting because they ha- he basically has like a back and forth with himself in the movie um, where yeah. he's the pizza delivery guy who's talking to Mikey. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then David Foreman, who played, who was in the suit for Leo, he plays one of like an, like an extra gang member that stands behind Tatsu. Um, and you can see him prominently like right when Tatsu is about to face off with Casey, when Casey infiltrates the, the club. Um, but other, the people that did the voices besides Josh Pius being the voice of Raph, um, Brian Tachi, or I think that's how it's pronounced Tachi, uh, voices Leo, Robbie Rist voices Mikey, and Corey Feldman um voices donnie which i didn't mm-hmm. know yeah um but yeah and he didn't want to do it really why yeah. wouldn't you want to do that that sounds like a really he, good at, gig at this point he's in his mid the late 20s so he was like yeah i'm not a kid anymore like i don't want to do kid stuff and so yeah but yeah, it's ninja just, turtles man i know and you're Corey fucking Feldman, right? Like, <laughs> have you have you followed up with any of Corey Feldman's like music career at all? No, that's wild. Yeah, he's basically like he's got this whole like Michael Jackson like rip off style mm-hmm. type thing. He's my weird. my mom went to one of his shows and she said it was just a, a total fucking train wreck, but it was so oh, enjoyable. God. I can't um, imagine. I'm sure it's not any good. Yeah, yeah, I've, it's not. It's, he has. It's he had a weird voice as a kid. There's no way that that got better as an adult. Slash, he yeah. could sing well. Uh-uh. What a guy. So to kind of touch on the origin of the Ninja Turtles a little bit. So it, the Ninja Turtles started as a comic that was released in 1987 by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, um, who the two had apparently spent their last collective two thousand dollars that they had to produce this comic. Um, and could just that's pretty much the gist of that I have, like, the creation of it. It kind of started with just, um, I believe it was Eastman who kind of doodled a, uh, a turtle with, like, a, with a face mask on. And then Peter kind of developed the drawing a little bit more. Eventually, they came up with four turtles that were each distinguished by their, you know, individual weapon. And um, apparently the idea for Shredder came, with, came when Easton had a... So, like, some cheese graters, or at least the ones I've seen are like kind of hollowed out in the center mm-hmm. and then have a handle on top. And he was messing around and it was like put his arm through one to hold onto the handle. So that way it was kind of like a gauntlet ar- um, around his arm. And he was like, could you imagine like of somebody having these, like something similar to this as like a weapon. And so that's where the idea of like shredder oh. came up, um, which is kind of cool. That is uh, fun. And uh, Splinter's name is actually a parody of the uh so in the comic in the daredevil comics daredevil's master's name is stick and so splinter is a parody of daredevil's master being called stick so stick oh. and splinter um so yeah there's a That's little cool. bit of, i didn't know that either to touch on the origin there yeah yeah cool um yeah that's pretty much the you know kind of the development at least from what i was able to find of this so of course you know we had talked a little bit about how much of a pain in the ass it must have been for these actors to be in these suits um there was and an actor hot. yeah yeah i um because it's it was constantly hot there was um one guy i know he's actually has like a full-on developed character in the second one um but apparently he started as a like one of the stunt like one of the other like stunt actors that would be in the suits for some like fight scenes. He talked about how he had to drink a gallon of water a day just to stay hydrated because of how hot it got in that suit. Well, um, they shot this movie in August in New York. Oh, that's which awful. Is awful. Yeah. Now, granted, a lot of the scenes that they're fighting mm-hmm. are at night, so it probably wasn't right. as hot as during the day. But either way, hot as hell. Mm-hmm. Can't imagine. 
Imagine doing that in like the scenes where you're in, like Raphael, how he has the the classic trench coat and fedora that he wears when he tries to sneak around, like wearing the suit plus all that, was, mm-hmm. and having to do stunts and all of that. Nope. God can't, bless can't those guys. Yeah. For real, <laughs> you're the real heroes. Hundred <laughs> percent. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all like the main stuff that I have in regards to like the development of it. So, did you have any uh? Anything else that you had picked up on that you wanted to facts. talk about? Yeah. Yeah. I have some fun facts for sure. This movie was obviously very fun mm-hmm. to uh, w- go back to and revisit and watch and then do some deep diving on for sure. Um, but like I said, Judith Hogue, who plays April, hard to work with, had a reputation of being hard to work with as an actress. Um, she did complain about, of course, the jumpsuit that we mentioned, but also mm-hmm. the shooting times being like we mentioned a lot were at night mm-hmm. so she was not asked back for the sequel obviously for yeah multiple reasons but probably that too <laughs> um and like i said casey jones uh elias codis mm-hmm. i don't know tons of things um shutter island zodiac haunting in connecticut blue bloods like i said just all around amazing actor i was surprised that i didn't remember him being in this movie I, I think am kind of a fan. I didn't maybe recognize him because if you look up him now, the first picture that comes up, he looks very different than how he looked in ni- in nineteen ninety. Yeah, uh, the first picture he's got like a whole like mustache, goatee thing going. His hairline's a little bit more receded. I mean, the face he's, is pretty much the same, but I mean, he looked like he's lived a hard life. <laughs> Honestly, that's the best way to describe it. <laughs> But, like, not because he did drugs or anything, more just because it's just couldn't get work as an actor. And so it's just kind of like, I don't know. I don't know. Um, Robin Williams is a huge fan of this franchise. and Really? Yeah, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle theme stuff for his son multiple times and was excited about this movie coming out. And he had worked with Judith Hogue um right before she shot this movie and she found out she got the part on this set i forget the movie what it was called something small um but he was like hours and hours talking to her about the the comic and the cartoon and how much fun it is and yeah he really loved it i guess that's cool which i think is sweet yeah yeah i love how like invested robin williams was like looking like like his, he named his daughter zelda after the princess from the legend of zelda yeah which is that's insane to me. But I think that's cool, too. I think it's really cool. Um, yeah. They they even got him to be in a, a Legend of Zelda commercial when the remaster of the game that um, was, like, around at the time came out. Like, they got him to do a commercial for it and everything. Oh, which yeah. Which is really cool. Cool. So. But, yeah. Every major studio turned this movie down. <laughs> really? So. Um, since the comic was not as popular obviously as they are today Mm -hmm. Uh, but it did manage of course to completely blow the box office away with over 200 million domestically in its open weekend alone yeah so definitely again not necessarily a cult classic by definition but again it's one of those classic cheesy 90s movies that regardless is still worth talking about but well it's classified as an independent film because it was like yeah. I said, nobody wanted to produce it, and this was the highest-grossing independent film until Blair Witch Project, which was a decade later. Yeah, because that was it. Blair Witch was like what two thousand, two thousand one, or it might have been ninety nine, yeah. I think. Yeah, so yeah. that's wild. I know when you think about it. Like this did um, better. No, I mean Clerks was still yeah, Clerks didn't do. Not so like hot. this. Yeah. No, not like this. But um, hmm. they did film a lot of it in New York. Like I said, a lot of the night scenes were filmed in New York, but um, large chunks of it were filmed in North Carolina also in the summer. So, yeah, even hotter weather for those fucking suits. <laughs> Gee whiz. And finally, Pizza Hut entered into a $20 million marketing campaign after the movie's release, uh, which is very famous now. Obviously, if you know the Ninja Turtles not only their pizza fascination, but I'm sure you remember um, is Pizza, it pizza Hut, Hut or boxes. Domino's? Domino's is in the movie as the pizza they order and yeah. the product placement. But after seeing the movie and seeing how well it did, Pizza Hut's actually the one that entered into the uh, marketing contract okay. with the 
yeah, the original film. So gotcha. I do remember as a kid, Pizza Hut's having the like Ninja Turtle glasses and the them mm-hmm. on the pizza box, and it was like a whole thing. So yeah, that was yeah, a good I was, partnership. Yeah, there was because um, they they this movie is also a good. Uh, like kind of like timestamp for the '90s a little bit, not just because of how goofy it is and the weird dialogue in the cast, but um, also the fact that Mikey talks about like, oh, he's uh, he's two minutes late. That's three dollars off the pizza. Yeah, thirty are, are, minutes or less. Yeah. Are you familiar with the reason why Domino's doesn't do that anymore? No. So it happened in New York, I think, in the mid to late '90s, where a um, Domino's driver had accidentally struck and killed a pedestrian. Oh, for, um, yeah, try- for trying to get to the 30-minute time yeah. mark. Yeah. And so they were like, yeah, we're not doing this anymore. And that was probably a good call. Um, yeah. Plus, that's just a really bad business model, in my opinion, too. Plus, Domino's pizza is um, fucking trash. Okay, it's... Okay, you know what? Yuck. It's not that bad. It's so it's gross. It's not that bad. Okay? It's, it's definitely not my go-to, because I ate a shit ton of it in high school and college. But I'm definitely more now of like a Romeo's guy. Um, All right. But if you're looking, if you're trying to get, you know, that medium pizza and uh, like breadsticks for six or six ninety nine each or five ninety nine each, it's a pretty good deal. My sisters worked there in high school, so we had way too much of it to yeah. eat all the time. So, yuck. It was just like the cheapest pizza place around. Um, Cause even like there's like really good pizza places here in Columbus, but mm-hmm. like they're all like thirteen bucks for a large, like they're one bougie. topping, like thirteen to fifteen dollars for a large one topping, which is insane. Cause you yep. can go to Domino's and literally get a large three topping pizza for eight bucks. <laughs> I'm not trying to advertise for Domino's, but that's like a really right. good deal. Hashtag not an ad. <laughs> yeah. Hashtag not a Domino's ad. I mean, Domino's, if you want to reach out and sponsor the show, I mean, I'm not opposed to that. You know, they up with the business probably now, need it. So <laughs> get into um, the podcasting world, Domino's. Yeah. It was up. I know that there was apparently like a, a small deleted scene that where Shredder kind of spars with uh, the rest of the Foot Clan, but I'm assuming that was probably cut again to avoid violence, you know, trying to show mm-hmm. as little violence as possible. Because if you look at the sequel in particular, they don't even have, like, their weapons available to them for most of the movie, I believe. No. They pretty much completely turned that into a kid's movie and got rid of all, like, the darker undertones and everything. Yeah. Um, which I guess the, the newer movies kind of just because of how much action and violent like action there is in the newer ones being a fucking Michael Bay film um, that they kind of lean more towards the comic than they do the cartoons, but they still have that really kind of goofy humor to it still. Uh, with yeah. Just, like, I can't gritty, imagine more gritty grown up visuals. But. Yeah. I can't imagine an Ninja Turtles movie where like you see blood or people getting stabbed or, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? I just can't wrap my head around that. I don't know. There's this guy on YouTube called Adi Shankar that produces a lot of, he calls it his bootleg universe um, where he'll do, he did like a rated R Power Rangers short film. He did like a a rated R um, like Mr. Rogers uh, short (laughs) film where it's like Mr. Rogers during the Vietnam war and everything. Oh Jesus. Yeah. It's wild. So I wouldn't be surprised if he did something like that. Um, I do remember speaking of Power Rangers, this is a weird side tangent, but I remember (laughs) something that hap- I watched Power Rangers 2 a lot as a kid, mm. and I remember later in life learning this, but then when you think about it going back, the two of the Power Rangers were sleeping together, and they got caught having sex on the set, like, oh, really? in the costumes. <laughs> oh so God. it was, like, a That's whole awful. thing. You can Google it. Google it. Like, two Power Rangers. The the pink one. And, and the red one? Maybe the red one, yeah. Jason, like, no. Hooking up. Somebody was hooking up with somebody, and they got caught having sex, and it was like a whole thing, because parents got mad. Not that they were having sex on film, obviously. It's just right. Like, no, but it's the mad, fact that but... yeah, that's not exactly something that you want to. No. Okay. Now I'm getting. A, I googled it, and I'm getting a lot of links that I don't want in my search history now. So yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. There's <laughs> tons of Power Ranger porn out there yeah, too. Get yeah. out of there. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and hit that. Left turn. Left turn. Cash there real quick. All right. <laughs> that was. Mm, all right yeah it's it was a thing though i remember 
And then I'm pretty sure I remember my mom not letting me watch it anymore. Wasn't there a whole thing, too, with, like, Barney and that the guy who was in the Barney suit used to hide cocaine in the tail of the suit or something like that? No, he would get high before oh, he'd get he get in the suit. Okay. Yeah, he'd smoke a bunch of weed and get in that suit and then I mean, talk I don't, to kids. I don't blame him. I, if oh, I had to deal no. with kids all day, I would probably blaze up right before the shoot, too. I think you'd make a better Barney if you're high. Yeah, because yeah. they probably probably just went over and did voiceovers anyway, so it's, like, for the character. No, he no talked. He, that whole, like, hi, guy, like, well, it was him. It was the guy oh, in really? the suit. Yeah. Well, I figured they would be all, like... Unless they did, still did voiceover after, and it was still him. But I'd imagine that the the suit would muffle a lot of his audio, unless they had a mic set up in the suit or something. I'm pretty sure it was in the suit. That would make sense. But yeah, but yeah, yeah. It's childhood what, stuff ruined for everyone. Yeah, You're it's welcome. Because like, it's the same amount of drama happens on the set of a kids movie that would probably happen on like a, you know your average adult, not adult film, but like. Yeah, a normal film, film. of course. They're still Um, adults doing this stuff. So it's like, but it is when you like go back and you hear the, you read these articles and you see these videos of like, like, you know, here's what happened on the set of this movie that will ruin your childhood. And it's like, damn. So it's true though. Everybody's out here trying to ruin it for everybody. (laughs) The 90s were a wild time, man. Yeah. Shit kind of calmed down in the 2000s, so those kids, y'all born in the 2000s, shit was a little <laughs> more calmed down for sure. Yeah, it's because we had the internet. We were all glued to our computers, so. It had to be more yeah. PC, for sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's all. All right. Well, what well, are we doing next week? Next time. What are we doing next time? Do we, what do we? I think we're going to do the double header. We're going to do Death Proof and... I always boggle the other name. This is another Tarantino movie? It's the duel. They did the Robert Rodriguez Tarantino, Planet Tear. Okay. Yeah. So I think we should do Death Proof first. Okay. And then do Planet Tear. Okay. Gotcha. That sounds like a plan. Yeah. All right. Well, this is probably one of the shorter, I know we talked about it last time, it's probably one of the shorter episodes we've done, but still I feel like we had a good a good chat about this movie. Oh, yeah. um, definitely worth talking about. Yeah, there's definitely. I love going back and revisiting these movies from my childhood. Um, yeah. As we were doing this, I was like, we might have to do it at some point. But I was thinking like, oh, why didn't I pick Treasure Planet as my kid cult classic movie? Treasure Planet. So it's a Disney movie that was released in like the early 2000s, like 2001, I think it was. Um and it has Joseph Gordon-Levitt as, like, the voice actor of the main character, Jim Hawkins. So it's, like, um, like Treasure Island, like the classic book, but it's, like, a sci-fi spin on it, essentially. Um, mm. And it has, like, the visuals in this movie are phenomenal. It's one of, like, the last 2D animated films that Disney did. Um, but it also incorporates a lot of modern, like, CGI as well, like, 3D stuff in it. And the way that it, huh. it was, like, the first movie to really blend, like, 2D and 3D animation in the way that kind of would, it would inspire, uh, like, Into the Spider-Verse and the way that it mixes a lot of different animation styles. Um, but it also just okay. has an amazing story. So I definitely think that we should touch on that movie at some point. We um, can always visit something that's, like, super technically advanced or something yeah. like that. We could go that route. Yeah. Um, there's a guy on YouTube called Bread Sword that has, like, a really decent kind of like short video essay on like treasure planet the Di- the movie that disney tried to like hide or like uh, like purposely made it so that it wasn't successful because it was one of those movies that was like came out in the summer with a bunch of other movies that were being released that did a lot better of it and the advertising for it was just kind of you know didn't do a good job of properly representing what the film would end up being and hmm. but yeah so there's a really yeah never heard of it cool story behind it but Anyway, so I guess y'all can look forward to Death Proof being the next episode that we're going to be doing here in the next two weeks. So, um, yeah, look forward to that. Thank you again, everybody, for tuning into the episode, whether you're listening audibly or visually on YouTube. If you have any ideas for what movies we should be doing in the future, let us know in the comments or in your review. Um, and that's pretty Follow much Follow us it. on all the things. Follow us, us on Instagram. Instagram. We got previews up there, so that way you know what the episode's gonna entail before you have to jump into the full episode um so that way you can be like oh, i don't i don't 
give a shit about that movie. I don't. We all skip yeah. to the next one. Um, or you could just tune into it anyway and just suck it up. Anyway, <laughs> thank you again, everybody, for tuning in. We will see you in the next one.